Home Bible Church. Uh, glad you guys are here to worship with us. As that video just said, uh, we are uh, his hands and feet, and we're more than just his hands and feet. We're his body, and so you have um, eyes and other organs, uh, but as well as the hands and feet of the one who is our head, Jesus Christ. So we want to welcome you. Glad you're here to worship with us, uh, and we are his body gathered for worship. We call this our worship gathering, not our service, because Worship is, should be a way of life. In fact, we all are worshiping all the time, whether we realize it or not. It's a matter of who or what we are worshiping. And so we gather together to um, be strengthened uh, in the truths that we are His body and that He's the one worthy of our attention and affection that follows. Uh, and so we're the body gathered now to be strengthened, and then we are also to be His body scattering and serving. And so uh, two ladies... Uh, in our church body, you're going to let uh, the women of our church know of an opportunity to be Jesus' hands and feet uh, coming up. Hello, everyone. Um, my husband and I run a program uh, called Powered to Move, and we are offering an event for women affected by disabilities. This is um, moms of children with disabilities, wives of husbands with disabilities, and women who have disabilities themselves. It's April 16th from 10.30 to 1 p.m. at Coventry Reserve. And the reason that we wanna do this is these are hardworking women who have um, many of the responsibilities most of us have, and they have the added responsibility of managing a disability in their family. So oftentimes they're isolated, they are exhausted, they're just running on fumes. So we want to give them a morning and an early afternoon event to help them renew and refresh. So this event will include a renewal area that's chair massages, hand therapy, makeup, blingy things, and then they'll go into a refreshing time, uh, luncheon, catered lunch, for them to connect with ladies around their table and um, we'll send them on their way about 1 p.m. And so there's information out in the foyer. There's a flyer that tells you all the different types of volunteer opportunities we have for this event and a way to connect with me. And so why are we even bringing that up to you? All last fall, we spoke about the giftedness that you received after you have trusted Christ as your savior. And now we have, an, and also um, women have been talking about how can we get together and serve as a group? So this is an opportunity that I saw firsthand come out in, a, um, in an object lesson, really, some years ago when my sister-in-law ran the Boston Marathon. And we were at mile marker 15, and we watched these people who were really getting tired but the crowd was amazing. It was a crowd of encouragers. They just wanted those people to succeed. They wanted them to be able to finish their course well. And so they were offering them water and words of encouragement, go Bob's dad, whatever they had labeled. And they offered oranges and banana slices to give them the boost of energy that was required. Well, my sister-in-law told me later that at Heartbreak Hill, she was ready to give up. And she said, but this one woman shoved an orange slice into her hand, which she had refused up until that point. And she said she just popped it in her mouth and she said immediately, it, she was like renewed and refreshed and she was able to go on and finish the course. We have an opportunity to be that crowd of encouragers for women who slog it out every day and sometimes just don't know where they're gonna find the energy. We hope it's from us. Thank you. Let's, uh, let's pray for that, and then um, we'll let these ladies off the stage. By the way, this is Sharon and Cheryl. They didn't tell you who they were, and that was my fault. Let's pray. Uh, God, we are, as we gather, we, we gather because you have made us your people through Jesus. And Lord, as they have shared about this opportunity to be Jesus' hands and feet, as just women within our body serving other women, uh, pray, Father, that you would, you would rally uh, a good group uh, to serve together, and that there would be a tremendous joy and that there would be a spillover just lord as you refresh them that they could be refreshers of others both physically and refreshers of their hearts we pray even before this event lord that you would pave the way that you would get women there uh, when they have just tough logistics even getting there lord get as many women who need the refreshment there as possible and then get as many of our women together uh, lord to be 
again, your hands and your feet. We pray you'd be glorified through it and your body would be built up in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, ladies. If you guys would stand, we're going to call one another uh, to worship. There'll be some passages from Lamentations uh, as well as First Peter that we're going through on, a Sunday, on, on our Sunday sermon series. And so um, I'll do the leader part, you do the all part, um, and we will call one another to worship. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to the living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession. That we may proclaim the excellence of the man who calls out of darkness into the heart of light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once we had not received mercy, but now we have received mercy. This we recall to mind, therefore we have hope. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. Great is your faithfulness. Your mercies, God, never come to an end. They are new every morning. What riches of kindness you have lavished on us. Your mercies are new every morning, even this morning. Let us sing with hearts full of gladness and joy. Our sins there are many, but your mercy is See 
we um, we thank you that even as this mirrors or images a little bit the story of the prodigal son that we feel like we're running back to your arms or you saw us from a distance and you were already running toward us so we praise you for your initiative we praise you for your unconditional love that lord we we don't know what that is because we know the conditions we put on one another where we withhold some of ourselves or we where even with you we withhold some of ourselves because we aren't sure but we thank you that again and again we're confronted in the pages of scripture and the reality of your love being demonstrated in history that you never fail that your love never ceases that your mercies are enough and that your mercies are new even this morning and lord even as we were just singing and that idea of that we might even come to a place of of acknowledging our need lord forgive us for our embarrassment forgive us for our embarrassment that comes from a a deception of self-sufficiency Forgive us, Lord, that even in coming in this place, even though we try to be real and try to encourage one another to be real, and it's not a very pretty place, Lord, we we still try to look pretty on the outside. We still try to look all together. And Lord, I love in Psalm 73 that Asaph is just like us, that he, he questions sometimes, like, surely I've just, I've tried to live a pure life in vain. Surely I've kept my hands pure in vain. Surely kind of keeping my religious nose clean just I mean what's the point because I look around and the evil are getting fat and happy their lives are at ease and he said Lord I when I was this way I was embittered I was on the way to bitterness and I was like an animal I just following my instincts wanting to lash out in anger at you wanting to hold back myself from you because I thought well you're just not coming through for me And he said, I thought all those things. I thought, what's the point of all this worship and trying to live a life pleasing to you? He said, that's where I was until I entered the sanctuary of God. And then I perceived what would really happen with them. But Lord, you got a hold of his heart. And he said, if everything else falls away, you, Lord, are my portion. You are my good. And the nearness of my God is my good. I pray that today you would break through where we try to glaze over, where we try to put on a look for others, or where we just withhold from you. We ask your forgiveness, and as Avinash prayed, we thank you that again and again your mercies are new. Your grace is welcoming us back, and that where our sins keep abounding, where our self-protection wants to armor up, Lord, it's your kindness that can melt our hearts and bring us to repentance. So we thank you that today is a day, an invitation again to just recognize you're the God who lavishes your love and grace on us. We just want to give you praise. We thank you for where we can see your hand in our church body as our elders celebrated on Wednesday, just seeing kids who are journaling in in here on Sundays and sharing that on Wednesdays and seeing students inviting fellow classmates from their school to, to come uh, be with them on Wednesday night. We, we see it in life groups re-engaging where so many of us kind of almost went dormant and disappearing for a while because of COVID. Lord, people coming back toward one another and opening up and seeing what a gift it is to be a part of your body. And so we praise you for your hand in this place. We praise you, uh, your hand uh, in, on us, moving us to like the ladies to go outside of these walls, to go into um, our neighborhoods to be attentive where you have placed us in our workplaces that we might be ambassadors. And so we thank you for that and we pray you would continue to give us that mindset each day. And Lord, we also want to be mindful as we did last week. We spent a devoted amount of time praying for the people of Ukraine and just the awful, awful war that is going on. And Lord, I just want to lift up a few a few prayers in that regard as we watch it unfold from far away. Lord, we are, um, we're, we're shattered, we're undone, we are unnerved. But Lord, we know it doesn't compare to those who are there experiencing it. And so we pray, Father, that you might display your goodness, your power, and your mercy. You might deliver Ukraine from evil. Lord, we pray for families who are separated, people who are suffering. They're hungry, they're afraid, they're missing 
their children or their husbands or wives. Lord, we pray for our brothers and sisters in Christ and churches in Ukraine and those countries like Poland and Romania and others that border where refugees are now pouring in. Lord, even within our church body, we are hearing reports from fellow believers we know there who are scrambling. Their churches have become refugee camps where pastors are like, hey, could a, a, friend, a friend pastor come and preach? Because I'm, I'm, just, I'm just trying to live as your ambassador, as your hands and feet, as your host for these refugees who are hurting, for taking in children who don't know where mom and dad are, and now they have an orphanage. We just pray that the church in those countries and in Ukraine, in the midst of a refugee crisis, would shine the love of Christ. Strengthen them for that. And may we be mindful to be in prayer for them. Lord, provide shelter, food, comfort, tangible support for suffering people. And Lord, we lift up leaders, President Zelensky, other leaders in Ukraine, our own leaders here. You would give them wisdom and courage. We pray for President Putin and his leaders that you might turn his heart. What a story that would be, Lord. But even if you don't do that, Lord, would you thwart his efforts at every turn as he is power-hungry, control-hungry, as he is um, assigning evil to his army, many of whom don't even know what they're there for. Lord, would you thwart that as the unthwartable sovereign that you are? Would you bring peace? Would you bring reconciliation? And lastly, Lord, would you do a redemptive work that we don't know how to pray for? But there, there would be many who come to faith in Jesus Christ through the display of the gospel, through all those we've just prayed about, but also through maybe coming to the end of everything they thought they could depend on and finding out the only one they can depend on is Jesus. And so we pray this in his matchless name for his reputation and for the building up of your body in that place, just as we're asking for that here. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, we're going to remain standing. Sorry. Kids, K through 4, you're dismissed. Uh, out those double doors. You're going to go with a really large 6'5 blonde haired guy. Uh, he's going to take you back, and we're going to continue in worship. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the singing
we were still sinners you died on the cross for us and you redeemed us and through your spirit you have placed us in your presence into the body of Christ and there's nothing that we did to deserve that and it's all by your grace and thank you God for giving us even the ability to place our faith in Jesus we thank you for your love in Christ's name we pray amen Doug and Mary and Avinash and Kathy um actually had a really good lunch with Avinash and Kathy this week just saying thanks on behalf of of all of us um, for their their um, leading of us and particularly uh, told them I know that they heard it from a lot of you but told them pr- really appreciate um, their humility and Avinash has an unfair advantage over me okay so like when he talks or prays you feel like maybe you're hearing from God because of that rich, deep Indian <laughs> accent. And you just got me kind of, you know, Memphis, whatever. <laughs> uh, but I would tell you, I, I say that humorously. There is something beautiful about it, but um, it really is your heart, both of you. So I just want to say thank you. Um, and actually, that's what I've entitled the sermon today is about beauty. It's about a beautiful life. Um, not the movie, I'm not going to say Bongiorno Principatia and jump all over the place. Um, that's, I can't even remember when that movie came out. It was a while ago. But in First Peter, where we've been, uh, he's talking about a hard and, and an increasingly gruesome life for believers, really for anyone, but particularly for believers. And so, Today, it's how do you live a beautiful life when you really are in the midst of wartime, when war is being waged and you are particularly uh, one of those against whom it is being waged. Now, we just prayed about it, but war is being waged in Ukraine. We are witnessing wars demoralizing uh, and devastating effects. We're also seeing uh, Putin's plans uh, to come in and just overwhelm. Um, Back in the day, they call it to besiege them. They're circling the larger cities. Um, They are sort of randomly bombed. I mean, it is just a, it it seems random, and sometimes it probably is random, and at the same time, uh, it definitely looks like it's not just to intimidate and threaten, but to constantly keep keep them unnerved constantly keep them uh, wondering because that fear can control them and that's his ultimate hope and so it's very ugly Uh, and yet in the midst of it we're seeing if you're tuning into any of the news channels I I love um, that they can find glimpses of beauty now these aren't particularly Christian um, influenced news outlets no matter which flavor you watch i try to actually watch all the flavors um, but they'll find these stories there where there's there are glimpses of beauty in the midst of the ugliness and the suffering Uh, stories of courage uh, in the face of evil threats stories of the church as we were just praying moving in mercy toward hurting people or opening their doors providing meals shelter sleep or a shoulder to cry on And so even in the midst of some of the ugliest times, we can see beauty. And God designed us because he's a God of beauty, of of actually perfect beauty. That, That beauty is one of that glory that's just that splendor, but it's also one of complete integrity that never has a fissure in it, never has a crack in it. That all of his attributes are perfections. And therefore, when we see him, we can see beauty. And we get little hints of that because we're image bearers. When we see, even if it's a non-Christian, doing something to move in mercy toward a hurting fellow human being. 
Well, Russia's attacks are intensifying, and I said it's strategic, it seems, and they're moving in these cities with a slow squeeze. My basketball team knows we're not great at dribbling, we're not great at shooting, but we can bring chaos. And so we press all game, all game, and they know the image I tell them is, I don't need you to make a steal like this and get on ESPN. I need you to do your job and slowly, I'm sorry for some of the moms, it probably makes you like, why are you telling your kids this? Slowly, like a boa constrictor, you can strict them until they lose the ball. And sometimes even in our timeout, it's not tigers, it's boa constrictor or anaconda. Why? Because it, it lulls you into this, okay, we've got time, but really they only have 10 seconds to get across the line. And we've wasted six of them already, and we're constricting slowly and slowly. That's what's happening in Ukraine. There's a constricting, and what happens is you're squeezing off the ability for supplies to get in. Um, those who've been in Israel, you, you look at, I think it was Masada is the name of it, and you just see it took the Romans like, two plus years I think it was to finally come they circled them but they had built it in such a way that well we're going to be here a while in fact the people I, I believe the uh, story goes that they killed themselves as they knew the Romans were now going to enter with food supplies to show you didn't you didn't um, starve us we took our own lives whatever and it's just because it's the the strategy is to squeeze and constrict and demoralize and take away the ability to, you know, keep living with food and water, etc. And so it is taking its toll. We see it already. What are we, day 11 uh, in that conflict? But there's a lot at stake. Freedom is at stake. Lives are at stake. And yet we still see that the Ukrainians are valiantly answering the call to resist and to keep up the fight. And that's beautiful. They understand better than we do. You can't live with a peacetime mentality when war is being waged against you and it is raging all around you. Now, moving from that to our passage today, because we don't have right now an army, right now we don't have an army around Allen or the Collin County. And yet the scriptures are also plain that in addition to that war, that we are in the midst of a war, whether we realize it or not. And the scriptures are plain that we're engaged in a war that's um, not necessarily involving tanks, planes, missiles, javelins, stingers. Y'all, y'all never knew that until this war, right? Javelins and stingers. It's not just a track and field event. It will take a tank out. Not only is that are those going on, but we are involved in a war, and Paul says in Ephesians, our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against powers of darkness. And yet at the same time, what I want us to see today in this passage is, we often make it only cosmic celestial, and we therefore take it out of the mundane. So it isn't, our battle isn't against flesh and blood. My enemy isn't the Russian, the Ukrainian, or you, and yet it shows up in flesh and blood relationship stuff it shows up in our everyday mundane and, and Paul Tripp I loved it. he said we 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 take the mundane out of the idea of spiritual warfare it shows up in every place you go in every moment you and I that the battle right now there's a battle that is going to take place and we're going to see here it takes place on the turf of our hearts and it takes place in our relationships and so we are called to live alertly, and to live beautifully. And those two things are actually part of a wartime mentality, not a peacetime one. A peacetime one, we go, do I want to mow the yard or not? I'll let it grow today. I'm going to sip on a nice drink with an umbrella in it. We are to live with that mentality that spiritual warfare is going on, and there is much at stake, and we're called to live alertly and beautifully. Well, how do we live that way? when war is being waged against us. Today we're going to hear Peter's message. Uh, it's an urgent message. If you turn to 1 Peter chapter 2, it's only two verses today. You think, oh great, buddy will be short. That's a danger to think that. I actually told my wife it's, it's harder to teach on two verses than it is 20. But today, Peter's urgent message to believers then 
when he was writing here in the 60s AD. And his me urgent message to us this morning is not to live with a peace, peacetime mentality. So God, through Peter, is going to call us to two wartime alerts. And he's going to let us know what's at stake with each alert. My prayer today, my prayer this week as I've been preparing, is that we will hear and respond to God's call on you and me to live a beautiful life, even in the midst of war. So, Look with me in um, chapter 2, verses 11 and 12. They'll be on the screen. Um, grab your Bibles or swipe in your device to your Bible app. I'll be nice and we'll, I won't make you. No, I'm going to make you stand. Stand up. Let's stand in honor of God and His Word. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 11 and 12. Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh, which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. Lord, I pray that you would open our eyes and our hearts to the truth of your word, that your spirit would enable us to understand, that he would empower us to live it out for your glory, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. So I'm going to walk through with this simple frame. First of all, and you can put the first slide up there, Connor, is, is who we are. You're, you may be like, well, man, I feel like we talk about that every week. It's because Peter keeps coming back to it. And as we said, even um, uh, the last couple of messages, part of why we have to continually come back to that is because of how forgetful we are. And because of, we'll talk about this a little bit more as we go, but because of also the lie or the propaganda of our culture that you can be whoever you want to be. That you, you build your brand. You build your identity. That's a lie. And so even, especially as war hits in Ukraine, what have we seen? We talked about it last week. What have we seen? Who are the Ukrainian people? Every single one you see interviewed. Now, maybe they don't interview the ones who are running for their lives. I don't know. But every one of them, what do they say over and over again? Russia doesn't know who they're dealing with. We will not fold to them. We will not kneel to them. Where does that come from? It comes from, they're like, we're Ukrainians. We resist. We want to fight for our freedom. That is identity. And the first thing, the foundational thing, is any pressure, intimidation, or war rate waged against us, the first thing that will be a foundational deal is our identity. Do we understand? Have we forgotten? Will we remember who we are? And if you look at verse 11, Peter actually uses three descriptors. First, he calls them beloved. Now, we uh, read it in the congregational call to worship. You know, you once were not a people, but now you're a people. You once didn't have mercy, but now you've received mercy. We are people who weren't a people of God. Our identity was hostile toward God and engaged in evil deeds, says in Colossians. We shook our fist at God. We said, I, you know what real freedom is, is I'll determine everything on my own. I'll do whatever I want. It's also a lie. But living out of that, then we went th that way. He says, you were once that way, but God in his mercy, which means, as I've said before, kid in uh, children's church worship, I said, who knows what mercy means? He says, it's when you, you deserve a wampum, but your dad doesn't give it to you. That's great exegesis of mercy. We are a people now of mercy. We did nothing to earn it. And therefore now, being those who are recipients of his mercy, we now belong to him. We are beloved. Because he sees us in the beloved, his son. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. If we are in Jesus Christ, there's therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Our identity is that we are in Christ Jesus. We had nothing to get ourselves into that, only to trust Him and what He has done and His finished work on the cross. And because of that, then, big word, God imputed to us His righteousness. He imputed our sin on Him. He took it on the cross, and therefore, if we trust Him, his righteousness is imputed to us, but that is of his mercy. 
And so, beloved, don't miss that first word because Peter is not up here uh, in verses 11 and 12 going, now I'm just going to let you have it because I know y'all aren't living the way you're supposed to live. No, he's just saying, beloved, I urge you. In the words, some of your translations say, I exhort you. Um, I, I almost called this, this first verse an urgent urge for your urges because he, he wants to urge them. He wants to implore them. Uh, you, um, what you can hear here is the relational sinew that has been formed and developed the muscle of relationship of brothers and sisters in Christ. He says, beloved, I urge you, I urge you to abstain from the passions of the flesh. And so who are we? We're beloved. We're also sojourners and exiles. We're not going to camp a whole lot on this, but I do want to at least acknowledge it because it's in chapter one when he's writing to those who are scattered, believers who are scattered basically in modern day Turkey. And he calls them elect exiles. You're chosen of God, not choice people. You're chosen of God because of his grace and mercy. And you're where you are because of his sovereign location of you there. But you're exiles. Or literally, it's your resident aliens. This is not your home. So a good question to just stop for, for a moment. This week, how have you lived? How have you um, considered, deliberated a situation, a trouble spot, a relational. How have you deliberated that or considered as you that hits you? How have you processed that through the lens of this is not your home? Are you wanting everything to, to line up in this way? Do you realize this is not your home? Do you realize that this world will not operate the way you would like it to? whether that was a godly motivation of how you want it or a not, you know. But are you processing? Are you processing that he has you here? And we use the word ambassador from Paul. How is it that he seeks for me to represent him as his ambassador in this place where I've been scattered, but sovereignly scattered as an exile, as a resident alien? The word sojourner, sojourner is the picture of someone who's on a journey, a pilgrim. Uh, they're on a journey to a destination. So they realize where they are and the now is not the ultimate destination. And so it's going to feel like, ah, it just doesn't feel like home. Sometimes I feel like I don't fit in. Sometimes the values that I feel like I'd like to hold to, I just am almost shy away from them because they feel so foreign to the people around me. Well, that's a decent indicator that maybe... You're his sojourner, and you are an exile. You're a resident alien in that place. So remember that he is talking to believers who are in a place that's not their home, and that place is growingly hostile, and it's full of hurting people, including those who are believers. But hurting people hurt people. And how in the world do we live in such a way, being an exile, being an ambassador, being a sojourner, how do we live in such a way? And Peter today will say, well, you need to realize that it's not only not your home, but there's a war going on and you're right in the midst of it. So you cannot live. I cannot live with a peacetime mentality. We need to have a wartime alertness. So I'm going to give you two wartime alertness, alertnesses. Is that even a word? Alertnesses? Alert and I in the Latin? Alert and I. Wartime alertness. Uh, alert one is join the resistance. Join the resistance. Verse 11 again, Beloved, I urge you, sojourners and exiles, that's who you are, to abstain from the passions of your flesh, which wage war against your soul. You are in a war. He says, this is, uh, these passions of the flesh, which I'm going to talk about in just a second, they're waging war against your soul. What I want you to note in, the, in the, just your English version, they're, they're waging war. This isn't one skirmish. This isn't one battle. This isn't, oops, we kind of came to this spot and didn't realize I was going to get mad at you and you mad at me, and all of a sudden we got into it. This is a strategic carrying out of a campaign. This is a plotted out, uh, then this is an adapted war. What's the goal of war? 
winning. Now, that's not original with me. Um, well, it's not even original with Paul Tripp, but I heard Paul Tripp say, I was like, that's pretty good. It's probably original with Schwarzkopf or somebody like that. No. The goal of war is winning. And what is the goal or objective of winning? Control. What is Putin trying to do? He's waging a war. He's doing it however he wants, to demoralize, to, to just cause havoc. But ultimately, he's seeking to win that war. He doesn't want to lose face. I don't know how much he cares about losing his military. He doesn't want to lose face. And what does he want? He wants control. What are the people in Ukraine resisting? Being controlled which is why they can fight and resist because they understand, wait a second, we just kind of bow to him. Now we are back under the thumb and the thumb doesn't care how much we feel squished under it. This is a war that we're involved in as those who belong to him. It's being waged against you and me and it is not a one-time skirmish, but it's a strategic campaign. Elsewhere, we can find out that there is our, our enemy, Satan, who is orchestrating that. We're not going to get on to that today, but really, we have three enemies, if you will, that we need to pay attention to. The world, the flesh, and the devil. Here it talks about the flesh, and the world around us is involved in how we view what's going on in life and what the good or beautiful life is about. But Satan, make no mistake, he is strategic. He is looking to constrict. He is looking to uh, intimidate. He is looking to lie. He's looking to woo us into what seems true and beautiful and is a trap. So there is a war going on that is a constant campaign. Well, what does he call us to do? Join the resistance. I just used that phrase because of what we've been hearing in the war that's really going on in Europe. But he says what? Abstain. Abstain from the passions of the flesh. Some of yours might say, keep yourself from. Um, some of yours might say, um, renounce, something like that. But to abstain, the word means to hold oneself away from. To hold oneself away from the passions of of the flesh that takes a recognition that whoa wait a second these passions are rising up these passions are are seeking to lure me seeking to motivate me seeking to drive me seeking to rule me and so to hold myself away from is to go I've, i'm at least alert enough to acknowledge this is something's going on and not just following my nerve endings not just following the meat of the moment or the heat of the moment to where like I'm going to lash back out at you because that feels right or I'm going to um, you know so and so she could she's had everything going for her in life at the, at the office here she could stand to be knocked down a peg or two let me when we're on a coffee break let me just slip in a little bit of gossip because that feels good and we don't even recognize if we're not alert to go, I'm tempted in that moment, but I'm going to hold myself away from that. I'm not going to gossip. I'm not going to, um, when you know I'm at um, the villages of Allen and walking through stores, I'm not going to see a woman and go, let me let my mind camp there. Let me let, me let my desires see what they'll percolate up. Those are evil desires. Elsewhere, um, we see sexual immorality. But it's also, because I think that's where we mostly go. Like, watch out for the passions of the flesh. So hold yourself away from those. Yes, uh, sexual immorality in all its forms, yes. But it's also greed. It's also gossip. It's also achievement for the sake of others looking to you. For the applause of others. Nothing wrong with achievement. So uh, the, these, are, these are those things that are drivers for us. They are, 
there are these desires that um, they can heat up. Now, here's what I want to tell you. A couple things today I want to throw you off on a little bit. The word used here for abstain from the passions of the flesh, the word passions can actually be used positively. Uh, Jesus, when he's talking to, about, to his men in the, the Last Supper, and he just said, you know, I have desired to do this supper with you. He's talking about, I've had that strong desire for us to be in this moment when I know I'm about to go to the cross, and boy, I can't wait. I've been filled with anticipation. There is tremendous, um, uh, just we're in right, the exact right moment, and I'm experiencing it with joy and sorrow and a mixture of love for you, full love, but a mixture of that washed with you're all going to scatter on me, like all of those things. And he said, I desired that. That's a positive one. It's also, though, um, all, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus. Like the same word can be used. It depends on the context. We know from the context, when he says, this isn't a, a desire of a good and godly thing. This is, you need to watch out and hold yourself away from, be alert to the danger behind what's tempting when it's an evil desire, when it's those things that can really uh, begin to, to heat up your desires that are seedy and sinful, hurtful, lustful, self-indulgent, and we know they're outside of God's bounds. Now, one other thing I want to say, where this idea can get sideways, it's not just evil desires. We've also got to be alert to, we've talked about this quite a bit when, through Jeremiah, because he hits idolatry constantly. But God has given you desires. He's given you desires to do satisfying work, to do work that makes a difference, to, um, to have uh, relationships that are good and healthy and that there's a mutual encouragement and that there's even an esteem. And so we have God-given desires that can go from God-given desires that we begin to go, well, I need a shortcut to that desire because I need a hit on that. I have a desire for sex. I have a desire for friendship. I have a desire for um, success in my work. Those can be God-given but when we take a shortcut or when those become the ultimate, now we've set it up to become move from a desire to a demand. And that demand then actually puts us in a place where he says at the end here, we may not have realized it, but God giving us those desires is a good thing. But then we exchange the free pursuit of those where we're freely pursuing them to now we're actually enslaved by the very thing we desired. Does that make sense? So it's not just the things that, oh yeah, that's seedy, that's, yes, hold yourself away from those, abstain from them, but it's also be alert to where our God-given desires have become inordinate. Our loves have become out of order. This, um, you know, my child's success at school has become too important. My, you know, my, my sense of security because of money has become too important. He says, now we're not even realizing it, but the enemy has used that and is doing the constricting. Because what is at stake? Look at the, look at the end of it. We've got to watch out for the passions of the flesh. Sorry, one other thing on the flesh. That's not just this, okay? This is where Paul talks about the war between the flesh and the spirit. That the flesh, because we have, we, we have been saved from the penalty of sin because of Jesus, and we have the power over sin in our, as he's sanctifying us, but we still have sin indwelling us. And so sin will take your good desire and go, let me tweak that a little bit. Let me put something in front of you. And our flesh, that your flesh is those cravings to get what you want. And so we've got to be alert uh, toward that. Why do we need to be alert? Well, what's at stake is your very own soul being conquered. What's the goal of war? Winning. What's the goal of winning? Control. And now that thing that may have been a given a God-given desire became demanding, and then it became your God or your ruler. And the good news is, at any moment, if we're in Christ and we found ourselves 
going back to those things, just as Avinash said, God welcomes us back to experience his mercy, his grace, his forgiveness. Because he doesn't want us to be prisoners of war. He doesn't want us to be enslaved, even to good things that have gone, they've grown too much, too important, and replaced him. And we all are susceptible to finding a God replacement. Let me just get a little bit of hit here for my craving, a little bit of, you know, my nerve endings could use a jolt here. God says, I want you to be free of that. So what's at stake is your own soul. And don't hear in that whether or not you belong to him. Because your soul is your, your life and your life in fellowship, rich fellowship, the good life with him. Okay, he's saying you can, you can really do some damage. You can be his and have no condemnation. You are secure in him. There's nothing can separate you. And yet at the same time, we can also not experience all that he wants for us when we are not alert because our souls can be taken captive. So we need to pay attention. We need to protect against following the flesh. Paul says um, in, in Romans, make no provision for the flesh. Starve the, f- the flesh. Or as Peter says, hold yourself away from the flesh. The word soul in the New Testament, even the Old Testament, um, can often be replaced by life. Um, that, that, that part of us that is our life. You are a living being. You're a soul, and it's that you are living in relationship with God. And so if you could, I don't have a slide for this, but think soul equals life with God, if you will. In this context, I want you to notice something. I want you to notice that Peter, through this, is actually telling us that not only is there a war being waged against us, but just like we see in Russia and Ukraine, there's propaganda that our world is putting out, sending a different message. Our world's message would be that your soul or the good life equals your wants. You following your heart. Now, it sounds true. Follow your heart. You do you. Now, I'll tell you this. Let me back off from that phrase slightly. When we did a series on that God intentionally designed and wired and purposed you, then you do you in that sense. But how we say it is, well, what, you know, you do you. Now, there's a good side. Don't be a clone and all that, you know, all of that. But what's embedded in that message is you follow your heart. Ultimately, it says you're now the authority. Actually, what it's saying is your cravings, your longings, your desires, your wants, follow them because that's where life is found. So our world would say soul or life, good life, equals getting your desires met. Notice Peter says that's wrong. Because what does he say? He doesn't say soul equals your wants and urges. He says your urges are what the enemy is using to war against you. And so if you want to know the good life, you want to know the beautiful life, you want to know satisfaction and joy and that it that you feel like is missing, don't listen to your flesh and don't listen to the propaganda of the world that wants to tell you that. And we have plenty of examples in our everyday culture now where, you know, you know, like a Billie Eilish, the young singer will just say, you know what, I just do whatever I want because that's when I'm really living. Except for what now the way you're living the way you want is now harming someone else or actually is doing harm to yourself. And so we've got to be careful as we join the resistance. We're in a war that's for our souls. But I wanted to point out that our world joins the enemy of our souls, Satan, with this propaganda message that you do you. Whatever makes you happy, you go after it. You've got to be really careful because our flesh says, yep, go after that. Once you have that, you're satisfied. What do we know time and time again? 
from the most famous, the most wealthy, the most accomplished. I reached the top of that mountain and I crashed. I reached the top of that, you know, pyramid and it disappointed, you know, it disappointed and destroyed me. Why? Because it was never intended to be life. Um, Jesus said in Luke 12, one of those other ones, life equals, he says, life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. I contend that that's one of those things that we say we believe, but we don't really believe that Jesus says that. I mean, we believe he says it, and we say we believe that principle, but we don't really. And it shows up in how we clamor again and again when the passions, the passion for money or security, identity. He says, no, go back. You're already beloved. This is not your home. Things are going to feel weird. It's wartime, so be alert. But we can't just abstain. We can't just um, do, you know, stay away from it. We can't, and I think particularly as Christians, we need to recognize not only we're in wartime, but the world around us, that actually the people around us that aren't actually our enemy, though we treat them that way, they're deceived by the enemy, and they also see us mostly for what we are against. You might call abstain from kind of the negative, like stay away from. It is. Watch out for that. But we need to recognize that we can't just be not doing these things. It's, well, what would we pursue? Because we are worshipers. We are followers. We, God's given us desire, and he, wants, he made us to give our hearts to someone or something. And if we take out the thing that shouldn't be there, there's a vacuum. So it can't just be, Christian, make sure you abstain from all these things. But what are you going to pursue? What's the life that God intends for you to pursue? And so not just what do we don't do, what are we against? What are we for? That brings us to verse 12. What we're for, what Peter's for, what God is for through Peter to them and to us is to live a beautiful life. Verse 12 again, keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles. Keep it excellent among the Gentiles. Your conduct among the Gentiles, honorable so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. Now, there's a couple things, a couple observations to make very quickly. Uh, first of all, Peter assumes that we are not physically separated from unbelievers. So we're not just supposed to keep our nose clean, you know, abstain from the, the seedy stuff. But, but he assumes that because we are ambassadors, because we are exiles, we are sojourners, we are even soldiers, if you will, that we are among non-believers. Because he says, among the Gentiles. Our vision statement even says that we're, we feel like we're called to live deployed as Christ's ambassadors among the nations, the next, uh, excuse me, our neighbors and the next generation. Not even two. We used to say two, and I like better. Rob Adams helped me think through that. He, he was always telling people um, what he does is he, he does life among Hindus. I was like, I really like that. <laughs> but that's the truth. You and I as believers are not called to become insular and to make sure we abstain from the passions of the flesh and therefore get away from everything seedy. We are to be away from those activities but we are to be among those who are our neighbors, who are unbelievers. We are to live among them. Second, conduct here is best understood as your daily way of living life. We are called, it's, it's a present tense, we are to keep on conducting ourselves that our way of life is, and some of your translations say, excellent. Some of your translations say good. Some of your translations, like the one I read, ESV, says honorable. We are to continually be living a life, a manner of life. It's actually consistency, not perfection. Consistency of conducting ourselves or living a, as a way of life that is set apart, distinctive. It's the way of Christ. It's set apart, and yet it draws close those who are watching. When we get to 1 Peter 3, 15, 
He says, set apart Christ as Lord in your hearts. And then he talks about, and when we do that and we live that way consistently, you're going to get questions. And the questions are going to be, what gives? There's something different about you. And he says, and then we'll have the opportunity to give the reason for the hope that is within us. When we live a beautiful life, even in ugly wartime, even in a culture that's hostile and hurting, we're then afforded, not through our perfection, not through our appearing to have it all together. Actually, when we're broken pots, like 2 Corinthians 4, the light of Christ can shine through, and that is what draws people to him. And so this is a way of life. This isn't a one-shot time of kind of doing the right thing. This is a way of life that's consistent. Third, this happens when the battle is not only this interior battle of verse 11, but on the outside when you and I are feeling like, man, everywhere I turn, it seems like the battle is against me. Or in my family, there are these one or two who have singled me out, and every Thanksgiving is hellish. And not because they're weird personality-wise, because they just have locked in on you and they're like in the old Star Wars, stay on target, stay on target, and you're the target. And he says, in that moment, honestly, we'd be tempted to go, how can I indulge my flesh? Because I'd like some comfort, I'd like some pleasure, I'd like to not feel like I'm the one being attacked. Or woe is me, I'm being attacked, I just need to be soothed in my flesh. He says, yet rather continue to live with integrity and consistency and live an honorable or good or beautiful life. And I tell you, the reason why I say beautiful is because there are two words for good primarily in the New Testament. And one of them is, hey, that, that's a good quality item here. This good means that, kind of an integrity of structure, dependability. It's good, but it also means with an adornment, a beauty, an attractiveness, a winsomeness. And some of us as Christians, uh, we can be good in the sense of keeping our nose clean and we got our doctrine straight and you, don't, you won't ever hear a curse word or this or that. But frankly, our life's not very beautiful. It's sterile uh, and, it, and it can come across as condescending or closed off. That's not this. This isn't just make sure you're not stained. This is live in a way that's, I love the word, fitting. If you are beloved of the beloved one, if you and I belong to him, then Christ was winsome. Christ was attacked, and he kept living consistently, even when the religious leaders were rejecting him, saying, well, you're of the devil. And he just kept living consistently. In fact, he lived perfectly. But there was something about him. The people were amazed at not his, just his teaching, yes, his teaching, but the things he did or the ways that he wasn't shaken by the religious leaders that everybody was a little nervous around. Jesus was like, I got this. Not cocky, though, just Christ-like. And he says, we are to live in a way that's consistent and with integrity in every moment. Yes, there's a, a war being waged. Yes, we're being attacked. We're even being labeled as evildoers. But he says there's beauty in the midst of that ugliness. And there's a beauty actually that can be seen better in those kind of moments than when everything's kind of hunky-dory. And the church historically has become radiant in times of its greatest persecution. In the times when they are, uh, or we are ostracized and put completely to the side, when we are being full-on attacked. And it's the lives of believers Remaining, clinging to the Lord, being consistent in their way of living, even as they're spoken against, that then draws eyes of others. So we're not called to live a perfect life. We're called to live an alert life and called to li live in such a way that it's, it's befitting or becoming our Savior. The one who made us took us from being a people not of mercy, but to become a people of mercy. That we would be people who drip with his grace and are secured by his love and who can even look through the eyes of our hater, our accuser, our mocker and feel a mercy and a pity and a compassion 
because our identity isn't shaken in that moment. Our identity is actually strangely confirmed. Think of Stephen when he's being martyred and stoned, and he looked to heaven, and heaven's open, and he could see Jesus standing at the right hand. There's one thing that should catch our attention. Jesus is supposed to be sitting at the right hand. Because you sit down when your work is finished. But for Stephen, when he was facing the evildoers, and he did so even in a beautiful way and died, and he, he died beautifully. Even in that moment, Jesus stood up and said, that's my boy, that's Stephen. I want to give you a couple of examples here. What's at stake? It's God's glory. He says, we may live in such a way, it's honorable, that even those who speak against us, they might see how we're living and the second time this word good is used here, see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. Now, every day, one day, every day, uh, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. But we pray that some, even who are our mockers and accusers, that God would do a beautiful work in their lives to where they go, you know what? I just can't shake it. There's something different. Can you tell me about what it is? Why is it you don't get upset about this? Why is it you didn't clamor for that promotion? Why is it that you, I mean, you really should have taken what was yours in that moment and you didn't. Why? We have the opportunity right then and there because of a life lived with consistency and integrity that Jesus might be proclaimed. The merciful one, the beautiful one himself would be proclaimed. And so God's glory is at stake and others good and perhaps even some being transformed. I want to... Um, with that in mind, I want to share with you just a couple of thoughts, or actually stories. One is uh, of a young man named Patrick. I knew him years ago, um, and he, uh, I was doing Young Life, and he was the cool kid. He could play guitar. In fact, he even has a blues CD or two. He was that cool. In Memphis, that's cool to have a blues CD. And, um, but he was cool. All the ladies loved him, but he was mysterious, all that kind of thing. But he also would stay at arm's length. And occasionally when he was kind of going off the rails a little bit and doing some things over here, so he was not a believer, he'd all of a sudden disappear for a little bit and he'd speak badly against some of us that he knew loved him. And he didn't think those things. He just thought, I got to do that. And uh, it was years later, I, I was a work crew boss on a ski trip. And it was the last night and the kids, this is when the kids hear the gospel and then they go out on their own. And we were down in the, we were the, we were the dishwashers. I had 40 college kids, dishwashers. I loved it. We prayed for those kids as they were going out. And then I said, hey, and then if there's anything personally going on, you pray. And if there's that awkward pause, I'll finish. And the coolest thing was those young life leaders who had pretty much thought he's just never going to come around. They actually were coming down the stairs to get a cup of coffee and paused because they heard us praying. Like, Shh, you know. And there was a silence. And I was just about, thankfully, God held my tongue back from going, all right, Lord, we were done praying. Because he said this, you got me, God. And it was very choked up. And all of us who knew Patrick's story were like, and he said, I'm tired of running from you. He said, these people have put up with me. And they've welcomed me. How they loved me when I didn't deserve it. And how they've lived, God. How they've lived. And because of that, I know it's real. And I know you're real, Jesus. And I give up. I give my life to you now, Jesus. But the coolest thing, well, that's the coolest thing. The second coolest thing was his young life leaders who you just kind of beat your head against the wall sometimes. And you think, I'm never making a dent of a difference. And it wasn't just the leader, and it wasn't a talk he referenced. What he referenced was, they just kept loving me, and they just kept loving me. They just kept pursuing me. And they never gave up, and they were always there. And he says, because of that, I know it's true. And if, you, if they can love me that way, and they speak of your love that's never failing, never ending, never conditional, then I want you. That came not because of perfect, precise words, not from a perfect life, but from a life lived consistently and with integrity. It was just a beautiful life. And one soul on the battlefield who'd been a prisoner of war was freed. 
I pray that God would give every single one of us in this room the joy of that. And it might be 15, 20, 50 years from now that God may just give you a little glimpse. I hope in heaven you get to hear lots of stories. But I pray he'd give each of us a little glimpse along the way that it's worth it. It's worth it to continue to honor him, to live beautifully, even when everything else is ugly. But it begins with doing the hard work of the interior and opening up to God and to one another. Here's where I'm struggling. You, you and I have to do that. Because if, if we don't live in God's victory in the interior battle, then the one outside just won't ever have what it could have. And but God intends that you and I would live beautifully uh, through that. I'm not going to read the other thing. I'm going to save it for another sermon. You'd be glad. It's like, it's really cool. It's from 130 AD, the epistle to Diognetus. Doesn't that sound just awesome? No. It's awesome that I'm preserving you from that. Um, I'm going to have you guys come up. Let's just do one, one, one verse of the song and end with a how marvelous or whatever. <laughs> Um, but really, we can only live the beautiful life in the midst of ugliness because of the one who was willing to face rejection, betrayal, being spoken against, mockings, beatings on the cross. And Jesus lived in such a beautiful way that even as he breathed his last, I love it, in the Gospel of Mark and I think Luke, the centurion who was right there, he watched the battle rage and he watched Jesus never give up on his heavenly father. And when he, it says, when he, saw how Jesus, how, when he saw how Jesus breathed his last, he said, certainly, this is the son of God. I pray that how we live, what it, we may not be breathing our last on the cross, but how we live, others would say, certainly there's something beyond you. Certainly there's something deeper than you. Certainly there's someone beautiful that I could know and who wants to know and love me. We're going to, close saying we want to give him our hearts and he's the marvelous beautiful one would you stand and then we're done this is that's the song I want sung at my funeral um, and my wife won't be able to make it through it to sing it so somebody else stand up to sing that song I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene um, and that I close with that because really when we think about what does it mean to live a beautiful life versus the seedy one is nobody talks about at your funeral those things that you went for in the moment that really were out of God's boundaries 
but the things mentioned at a funeral are what really mattered to you and where you really made a difference, where they share where you were there for them. And that's the human side of the motivation, but that's the picture. The beautiful life is what we talk about at rehearsal dinners and funerals. It's the stuff that really matters. And I pray that God would free you and me up for the temptation of chasing trivial, selfish, passionate, nerve-ending things, and we would live for those things that are the beautiful life. Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh which wage war against your soul. Let us keep our conduct among non-believers honorable so that when they speak out against us as evildoers, they may see our good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. Go and live beautifully this week in Christ. Have a great week.